Could you please put your hands together and welcome uh, to our panel Rory Sheridan from Diageo, John Trainer from Onside Sponsorship, Peter McVerry from U105 and Dr Adrian Devine, University of Ulster. And as I say, if you do have a, a question that you would like to ask our panel, please do stick up your hand and I'm sure they will uh, more than happily try and answer your questions. Uh, we're going to kick things off uh, with a question uh, to Rory, first of all. Where's Rory at the end there? Thank you very much in the middle. Thank you, Rory. Um, today, of course, all about sponsorship for events and making that perfect pitch. But what are the fundamental principles that you build your sponsorships on in order to communicate with your target uh, consumer? Um, very good question, um, Mark. In relation to our thinking, which is our latest thinking around activation of sponsorships, which is, I guess, the key of, of the message that I'd like to get across today is if you're a sponsor and indeed a rights holder, um, only ever engage with a rights holder that will allow you to uh, activate behind the investment that you've bought into. And indeed, if you're a rights holder, make sure that you have assets to sell a sponsor. The key, I guess, principles that we would look would be to being a consumer-facing brands company is funny enough to put the consumer at the heart of everything you do. That might seem like a very obvious uh, statement, but you'd be surprised the amount of companies and brands all over the world who you know, get a little bit sidetracked from the size of the opportunity and the prize, which is it, sponsorship is a form of marketing, and market, marketing is a, a is a, a channel of communication with your consumer. And unless you target that consumer and you tell people about it, it's a total waste of money. An evolution of that would be to uh, move away from an area that a lot of companies and brands have focused in on historically in the past, which is passive awareness. So basically, you put a sign up at uh, a pitch, up at a concert, and it, nobody sees it. it's wallpaper. We've moved to what we call active engagement, which is developing concepts and brand propositions, experiential engagement opportunities, um, like Richard would have presented earlier on, the Captain Morgan uh, consumer event that we had at Oxygen this year. Um, that's basically, you know, it's not just telling consumers something, it's bringing them into the brand, bringing them closer to the brand, connecting with consumers around their passion points. The great thing about sponsorships is that you are connecting with a consumer in a medium that they want to be spoken to and spoken with. And it's not about lecturing to them like we are today, apologies. It's about connecting with consumers around those passion points. So hugely important in those areas. Well, if I could bring uh, Dr. Adrian Devine in there. We heard this morning from Jeff and we heard from Richard. We heard from our perfect partners, from Catherine, Suzanne, Lindsay and Julia, about the strategic approach to sponsorship. Why is that so important? Well. Just to build on what was said earlier on today, you do need a strategic approach to sponsorship. And while I was listening to the speakers, I was thinking in terms more of smaller events in particular. I think they are certainly facing a challenge in a uh, few years. Uh, the research would suggest uh, that larger events in particular are still able to command and uh, broker large sponsorship deals, but smaller <laughs> events, particularly in the areas of uh, the arts and culture, are struggling. And I think the reason they're struggling is because there's less sponsorship around, and as a result, they need to be think more strategically. Um, the businesses that are actually going to do the sponsoring they are thinking more strategically, they want a return on their investment. So from the, sponsor, from the event organizer's point of view, and especially smaller events, they need to be more strategic. And it's difficult for smaller events because in many cases, um, I know from my own experience in organizing sporting events, it's often a voluntary um, committee that is actually involved in organising the event and it's time consuming just going through the event management process. 
never mind trying to think about sponsorship and uh, develop a strategic plan to it. But it is essential that they sit down as a committee um, and develop a strategy on sponsorship. They need to, what was said earlier on this morning, things like target, uh, find emo was an excellent example. You need to target the right sponsor and you need to develop that relationship. And that is time consuming for people who maybe uh, are, as I said, at smaller events with maybe family commitments and of course work commitments. So it is time consuming. But ultimately what that event uh, and that event committee must remember is that, and again it was just to reiterate that was said earlier on today, it's easier to keep a sponsor than to find a new sponsor. So it is worthwhile adopting a strategic approach, especially now for smaller events. And one would imagine that that's particularly because of the economic challenges we have. And if I can bring in uh, John Trainer, there, founder and MD of Onside Sponsorship, we talk so much about the recession and the economic climate. So what changes have had to be made over the last number of years? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean our experience or what we've found is that to a certain extent, the recession has been a good thing for a sponsorship. Um, and I say that um, with some facts behind that um, in terms of the growth that um, has been experienced in sponsorship globally. So um, in 2011, the forecast is that sponsorship will actually grow this year um, by 5%. Um, and that's in Europe. Um, so there certainly is quite a lot of um, companies have gone back into themselves. Um, they've looked at everything about their businesses um, at all levels. But within that, they've looked at their marketing um, and they've said, so uh, what's, the, what's the mix that we're spending in terms of um, above the line advertising versus um, sponsorship versus other formats? And in a lot of cases, in those very deep reviews, they've got to a conclusion. And that conclusion is that in actual fact, we didn't really get sponsorship properly. We didn't really fully understand its potential and its role. Um, and in a lot of cases, we've seen clients grow their, the percentage of their marketing budgets that goes to sponsorship from 5 to 10% up to 25%, some up as high as 40%. And what's underpinning that fundamentally is um, that there's a new level of consumer understanding about how sponsorship works. Um, and that's built on lots of um, in-depth research. Um, but fundamentally, what that research is demonstrating is that if you go out and ask the general public, so where do you think a company should spend their sponsorship or their money? Should they spend it on sponsorship or advertising? You'll find that the majority, if they made a, could make a call on it, they'd say, we'd rather see the company spend their money on sponsorship. Equally, we found that um, when we say, well, what about in the recession, companies um, stopping their spend on sponsorship, how would you feel about that? Half of consumers would say, don't even consider, we want you to maintain your spend. If you're going to do anything, we want you to increase it. So 25% said increase it, 50% said maintain it. So there's a, there has been um, a kind of a, a love affair built up with sponsorship among consumers. And that's been built over 10 years of double digit growth in sponsorship where um, events like uh, across the nation, like the World Special Olympics, um, have really endeared consumers to what brands can do with sponsorship and ha have really got them to buy into it and believe in it. Um, and so the consumer is now sitting there very receptive and judging a brand and a company and saying, we want you to talk to us through sponsorship. It's our preferred media, our preferred mode of communication. And absolutely critically, what they're saying is that I trust a brand if they send me a message via a sponsorship than via other forms of marketing communication. So that's the type of intelligence that companies are actually gathering big picture fundamental realities, which they're taking back up to their board business tables and saying, we have to change the mix, guys. We have to rebalance how much we're putting into sponsorship. Because our, as Rory said, our consumer is telling us, talk to us via sponsorship. So on that basis, um, I think you know, it's probably not all so doom and gloom for sponsorship. And I think it probably has managed, um, not quite to beat the recession, but has certainly managed to stay strong and, and, and hold up its hand uh, in the current climate. Thank you, John. And Peter McFerry, if I can bring you in now, station manager of U105. We, we, we've heard and we've read the ugly headlines about the downturn in the advertising industry within the media. The media plays an important role. There's absolutely no doubt about that. Does that make advertising or sponsorship more of an attractive offer to businesses? Well, I think, Mark, what we've seen over the past number of years, as John mentioned, the double-digit growth in sponsorship. We as a station, for example, would have experienced probably triple digit growth over the last three to four years in the amount of sponsorship that we would generate as a revenue stream for you. And if I have our interest in it is twofold. You know, we're not someone who is a rights holder and we're not someone who has a potential sponsor in terms of putting cash behind someone. We're an organisation and we're a platform, as majority media outlets are, who can deliver something for both of the aforementioned partners 
in terms of bringing an awareness for the brand and bringing an awareness for the rights holder, predominantly an awareness of the event and ideally in delivering footfall to them. We've definitely seen, like, uh, the example for us in Belfast, U105 is part of the, of the UTV media. We have a lot of interest in radio in, in the Republic of Ireland and interests in radio, local commercial radio stations in England and a national brand in Talksport. The, the percentage of our income that we deliver through sponsorship in Belfast is higher than that in Dublin and higher than that in London. A little bit through our desire to grow that over the past couple of years and a little bit through people in this market looking at it probably as a more achievable and affordable and more cost effective and more efficient way of spending their cash. It was interesting to hear Suzanne from Emo there talk about their partnership with the Grand Opera House and say actually it was a, it was a reallocation of, forgive me if I'm going too far, but a major element or maybe a majority of the marketing budget towards that to say well actually you know, we've maybe been getting it wrong in doing four, five and six things. Let's do one thing really well as opposed to go half cocked at a number of things. Okay, there's no real scientific formula to this panel discussion. Certainly I have a list of questions here in front of me that I will ask the panel. But if there's anything that you guys want to chirp in and ask, please feel free. Just give us a wave of the hand. Uh, yes, this gentleman towards the back. Hi, Rory. This is a question for you. Stephen O'Reilly from Crosstown Media. Rory, I watched the video online recently. It was an interview with you at the Irish Sponsorship Summit. And you, you said that uh, participation is going to be the big trend in sponsorship going forward. Can you elaborate a bit further with some specific examples, say any brands within the Diageo fold? Yeah, uh, it's a good question. Um, I guess it's, it was our eureka moment a couple of years ago when it was, um, I mean, there was a lot of brands competing in the same space as us and we wanted to try and differentiate ourselves. And, uh, there was a, a, gap, a gap that was missing from what I mentioned earlier on in terms of moving from passive awareness to active engagement. And the active engagement piece for us, quite simply, is participation. It's getting people to actually participate with your brand, to have a kind of 360 conversation on a literally year-round um, platform with them. Um, we, the two probably best participation platforms that we have that people in the room will be most familiar with would be Arthur's Day. Arthur's Day isn't a traditional sponsorship in its own right. It's something we've created ourselves, but it is something, uh, m music, to be perfectly honest, which is incidental to actually Arthur's Day. The whole idea is the communion and bringing like-minded people together to celebrate the legacy of a great man that was Arthur Guinness. So that is, for us, the ultimate participation platform. That was propagated, I guess, by the global penetration and expansion of broadband. Uh, and we do not underestimate the power of that and what it's done for us in the past. People were talking about websites and driving people to websites um, earlier on. To be honest, we've moved on from websites. We've built some of the best consumer-facing websites uh, any brand has ever done. But the key thing is they're consumer-facing. If your consumer isn't facing it, looking at it, they're not consuming it. So, uh, you know, we're just thinking more laterally. And it's a case of go where the fish are swimming. You know, people are consuming media in different outlets, different ways. They're Facebook, Twitter, and that's where we're putting a disproportionate amount of our time into that. Just the other piece, the other section of, um, <coughs> so the, the other example of the participation to answer your question would be around rugby. Rugby obviously is a massive platform for us across Western Europe, uh, particularly in Britain and Ireland. And um, one of the, 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 the platforms that we have developed to, to bring the participation element of that sponsorship to life is Area 22. And basically, it is the, the consumer engagement roadshow nights that travel all around Ireland. It's a relatively new phenomenon for us in GB because the Western European uh, company has only been recently established, but it's something that we're planning to do in GB. There's one on tonight, for example, in Galway. And you know, it's going to be broadcast live on our Facebook page, which is the number one um, sport Facebook page in Ireland. Uh, so you'll be able to see it uh, once you log on to Guinness uh, supporters, uh, so Guinness Rugby supporters. Um, there'll be broadcasts on Twitter. Uh, it will be broadcast live tomorrow night on TV3 in the Republic uh, called Area 22. And it will also be broadcast live uh, on the Sky Pub channel, which is encouraging people to go to the pub 
at the moment, obviously, business for everybody is tough, and, and not, not least ourselves, but uh, customers are equally important to us as consumers, and we want to drive the relevance of pubs back into people's you know, social experience, and this no better place to consume this product, which is the rugby product, uh, with a pint of Guinness in the pub. So okay. that's our early uh, evolution and steps into participation. We're not the experts at it, but we're making great inroads, but there will be uh, a huge amount of expansion in that area across all our brands, from uh, stuff you saw there today, as well as Smirnoff Nightlife Exchange Programme, which is a global entity for us as well. Okay, Rory, thank you. Any other questions? Does this gentleman over here? Just Hi there, um, I'm Margaret Campbell from the Southern Regional College. Um, I wanted to ask with reference to the St James's Park Sports Direct debacle, I suppose you could say, do you feel there might be a saturation of sponsorship, that there might be organisations maybe forgetting their ethics and their heritage through it, through selling themselves? Okay, who do you want to pick up on that first of all? I don't know, it was really Jeff Wilson I wanted to ask <laughs> <the question. laughs> Well, you can ask him that at lunch then. Uh, Adrian, would you like I'm to take for Jeff answer? Yeah, yeah um, I think it's certainly a hot topic at the minute. And uh, with the history in Newcastle and the, the strength of the, the loyalty to the, the football club there, it's caused a lot of controversy. But the, the owner rightly came out with a statement that um, Sponsorship is hard to come by at the minute. Uh, the, the, it's a well-known fact that he has been trying to offload that club for the last three to four years and uh, would probably have uh, sold it if uh, had got the opportunity. And you can see that they need extra revenue and that's just one, that's an obvious way. Uh, the fans are not happy, but I'm afraid it's the reality of the world we're living in. And okay. Because it's a matter of time will change. Thank you, Adrian, for that. And maybe Jeff will elaborate at lunchtime. Uh, and this gentleman over here. Uh, sorry, Matthew Gallagher, Concept Management and Promotion Services. A uh, question, please, for Rory. Uh, actually, two part question. First of all, of all of the things that you're looking for in sponsorship, how do you rate the experience of your consumers at that event? Is that your number one? priority when you're, when you're looking at potential sponsorship. And uh, that's part one of the question. The other one is I understand that certainly in the Republic that um, drinking is going to be banned from sponsorship as cigarettes. Is that, have you heard that? Is that the case? Uh, I'll answer the first part first, that's okay. okay. Um, it ties into this gentleman's question around participation, I guess the first part of your question, which is uh, yes is the answer, um, but yes with a caveat. Um, we cannot guarantee that if um, one of our consumers, a fan of rugby, goes to see Ireland versus England in a Six Nations game in the Aviva Stadium, that they're going to have a great experience. We're not responsible for that. But we're partly responsible for the consumer journey, which is the participation and engagement piece, a la the Area 22 event on a Thursday night, the build up the excitement, all the communication via Facebook and Twitter from the, the the, I guess the owners or, and originators of the site, which is ourselves, because we have a good appreciation, obviously, of, of what it is we're trying to communicate. We also communicate that message through our rugby ambassadors, which we have about a dozen or so between GB and Ireland. Um, and, and that's the build-up, the palpable level of excitement that we can bring, obviously trying to get people to gather in the pubs with their mates. Uh, it's a Guinness-branded experience when they go in in terms of visibility, and it's, it's a through-the-line approach in terms of look and feel and imagery. And then it's the... Um, it's the you know it's the it's the it's the pint at half time in the stadium. It's the it's the, the crack and and the divilment and the post mortem in the pub afterwards. That's the piece of the consumer journey that we don't control. The consumer controls that we're I guess building the pitch for our consumers to play on, and we hope that they engage with our brand in a positive way by providing this collateral for consumers. Basically, the second part of your question is there is a proposal. Uh, that may or may not go to the cabinet in the Republic uh, in, in the next number of weeks, proposing that there will be an outright ban on alcohol for sports, uh, music, festivals, all activity, uh, uh, and it to be in place and executed by 2016. There is 
a lot of uh, I's to be dotted and, and T's to be crossed before that even gets in front of Cabinet. So I would be hopeful that a more measured approach is taken by government, particularly in these very difficult times of austerity, that we don't control, or sorry, sorry, that government by legislation don't uh, switch off a vital tap of revenue for rights holders, the length and breadth of Ireland. Because if this happens in Ireland, it will have a knock-on effect to the rest of the European Union, because we're all big one market, whether we like it or not. Okay. Um, and uh, therefore, it is the aspiration that drinks companies like ourselves and indeed our competitive set um, work to the, the self-regulatory -regula environment that is across all of the European Union and uh, most of the, uh, I guess, mature markets around the world, North America, etc., etc. So that would okay, be. Okay, Rory. Sorry, sorry yeah. to interrupt you. Need to press on and get a few more of the guys in before we take a break for lunch. John, if I can bring yourself in, um, possibly some helpful news for our, the guys gathered here. Uh, what are the major global sponsorship trends that are occurring at the moment? Um, there's obviously lots, uh, so I'll just try and hone in on a few um, to be brief. Um, I think Richard nicely teed up um, what is um, a really growing trend and, and, and one of the questions really went around venue naming rights. Uh, there's no doubt that venue naming rights um, has been one of the fastest growing segments or categories within um, within the sponsorship industry. Um, I think potentially we're about to see the next phase or stage or generation of venue naming rights or naming rights of, of properties. Um, so um, I suppose again, um, Richard's Live Nation um, um, organization have recently organized a venue naming rights for the Borgdash Energy Theater, which was a Grand Canal Theater. So that's seen as starting to step away from purely sports stadia um, and into other spaces. But um, what we are starting to see in other markets as well is naming rights of other facilities. So even in, in sports facilities, they're now naming the training ground or the training facilities. So while the main area might be um, named by a certain brand, another brand might actually just single out the training facility zone to it. Um, so, so that's a, an example. But equally, we're seeing train stations and bus stations and um, potentially even as things get tighter, you know, public buildings um, that require revenue. So I think that venue naming rights area is definitely one that is growing. Um, I think we're seeing a new, a new bunch of sponsors. So while the alcohol sector, financial services sector have been particularly active and busy um, in sponsorship for the last 10 years, um, and they'll continue to be active. Um, but equally, there's new categories bubbling up now. The car sector, believe it or not, even though they're, uh, you know, the industry, you know, the sale of cars isn't necessarily flying. Um, they are probably one of the busiest sectors we're seeing in terms of shopping and buying for sponsorships right now. So I would suggest and predict that in the next two to three years, you'll see a lot of car brands doing sponsorship. Uh, airlines are really busy, are very actively, very busily shopping at the moment. Um, so I think we're going to find a new, a new bunch of sectors of categories that weren't all that prevalent in sponsorship in the last decade that I think will be up at the top uh, of the bunch. Um, and then maybe just one other one is lots of brands have been going into themselves and lots of rights holders have been going into themselves trying to find extra assets that they can sell. So we've got the obvious, but they've tried to look beyond the obvious and say, what else could we sell? I think a good example of that is Man United, who have um, identified that their training gear as a, as a piece of asset that they were just given away. They weren't necessarily um, charging or, or having a sponsor pay for that. Um, whereas now um, they've sold the rights to that to a separate brand. So while Aon will be on, on the main jersey, the training jerseys that are being worn are being worn by DHL, a completely separate brand. So the theme or the point or the trend is that, that there's, a, there's a lot of creative approaches being done to saying, what are our assets, what have we, and actually going laterally and trying to find new assets that they can sell within the mix. Okay, thank you very much, John. And to yourself, Peter, a lot of people are under the illusion that sponsorship on the likes of radio is a very... Uh, costly affair. It's not a case of one formula that works throughout uh, the whole of your radio day. I suppose what, I, what I'm suggesting is you know, you, you're open to ideas from these guys and you can adapt to a situation that suits them. Well, I think one of the key points that I've taken from all of the discussions and probably the thing that, that links so many of them through and, and maybe gets back to the St James's Park question there and Mike Ashley is the whole thing about is about creativity and the thing that's been mentioned this morning as well by a number of speakers is that it's not one size fits all and it's not off the shelf. You know, the thing that we in the media are able to do is be flexible in terms of how we deliver it. And how we would deliver a partnership with Jordan Show Ireland, for example, is different than how we would deliver a partnership with the Circuit of Ireland. And there, there are different ways to do it. I think the, on, on the question of, of St James's Park, I don't think it was, it's not a bad sponsorship move, but it was a bad PR move 
in the way that he handled it. You know, he, he was right to do what he did, and he's right to try to sell that, and he's got every right to do that. But the way in which he did it, because of the love that there is for that stadium among the fans in that area, is, is very different. It would be the same with anyone. I, I think it may have been Richard that mentioned this morning in terms of the, the right fit between the, the sponsor and between um, the brand or the event. You know, it's important to get that right, and then it's important to do the activation. Our role is probably separate in between those. We wouldn't be the person who would match the events holder together with the, the, um, with the sponsor. And equally, we're not as involved in the activation in terms of on the ground at the event. Our role will be involved in driving football, putting bums in seats, raising awareness, <coughs> which is probably slightly less relevant for something that Richard or Rory are doing because, thankfully, those guys are, are behind events, for example, if they're selling tickets, where it's likely to be a sellout. But I know a lot of the people, for example, in the room here are looking at events that are on a smaller scale than Oxygen or on a smaller scale than a Gaga concert that's going to sell out by itself. So it's how do you maximise your revenue and your benefit for your sponsor, for your own bottom line, for your funder like the Tourist Board? Okay, Peter, thank you very much indeed. Uh, I wish we had more time for this panel discussion. It will continue over lunch. Meantime, round of applause please for Rory, John, Peter and Ian.